in the few minutes that remain, I want to draw our attention to something. This is going to be a, a different uh, message this morning. Celebrating both ordinances together at the beginning of a new year. It seemed wise to me to set a couple of verses of Scripture before you. And then let's take a look at what this wonderful confession of faith has to say about baptism and the Lord's Supper. I know you're standing up and down a lot, and I don't mean to tax you on this, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me one more time. Turn in your Bibles to two brief passages, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. One speaking, Jesus uh, speaking regarding baptism. One, Paul teaching on the Lord's Supper. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen. So that once you to see it, we value, we value your, your ears hearing the Word. We value your eyes seeing the Word. We value your hands holding the Word. If you don't have a Bible, uh, talk to us about that. We want to put one in your hands. Follow along as I read. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then 1 Corinthians 11, 26, we just, we just read it responsibly. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we believe these things. Practice these things. Declare these things in word and life to those we encounter in the way. Thank you. Please be seated. When we were going through our study of these, of these five critical truths back in the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and we looked at those, those five solas, we told you then that uh, there was a pretty much united among the reformers, a united assertion of what constituted a true gospel church. So the, the authoritative preaching of the, of the authoritative word was one of those things. The uh, biblical practice uh, of, the, of what they would call the sacraments. I told you at the time, and, and please don't miss, I love, I love our brethren from, from the Pado Baptist communions, those who who practice a, a child sprinkling. I love them. But I told you how ironic it was that some of these great minds insisting on the, the biblical practice of the ordinances uh, got it wrong on baptism. We don't say that in a sectarian way. We don't say it in a haughty way. We simply say it being honest to the scriptures. But that was one of those things that you would biblically practice believer's baptism by immersion, which is what the scripture teaches. That you would biblically practice the Lord's Supper. Keep those in check biblically. And then they added, the reformers thought there was a third sacrament or a third ordinance. And that was the practice of redemptive corrective church discipline. We talked about that back uh, in October, you remember. And we have uh, a wonderful, we've adopted as a church, a wonderful confession of faith, uh, the second oldest a Baptist Confession of Faith, the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 as our Confession of Faith. And I thought it would be good today. Take a few minutes and I've, been, I've exhorted you in the past to read through that. I've exhorted you to, to go to that. Charles Spurgeon said when, when it was adopted at the Metropolitan Tabernacle where he served, he said, we have in this confession a body of divinity, that is a systematic theology, in what he said, small compass, in a, in a small package, easily read, easily digestible. And I've encouraged you to lay hold. We've given one of those out to every family. You should have one in your home. If you've misplaced yours, which happens, again, let us know. We want you to have that, to read from it, because it gives you answers to questions about what does justification mean? What does effectual calling mean? What does Trinity mean? And in that confession, there are three chapters, chapter 28, 29 and 30 on baptism and the Lord's Supper. Chapter 28 uh, is a really sort of introduction to both ordinances. And we, we use the word ordinance. Sacrament is a, is a fair term. 
if you're using it saying that these ordinances are holy, but if you're using the word sacrament to say that these ordinances have saving power, then we dismiss that. And you're going to hear that, particularly when we get to the Lord's Supper, you're going to hear how our Baptist forefathers wanted to distance themselves from the, from the Roman Catholic position, which was, which was the antagonist in the whole Reformation movement. How they would distance themselves saying what it's not. But listen to this. Follow along with me in this. On the, on the 28th chapter, on baptism and the Lord's Supper, it simply says, baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution. In other words, positive, they are to, they to be practiced. And sovereign, they're given sovereignly by God. We don't get to tamper with them. They're appointed by the Lord Jesus, the only lawgiver, and are to be continued in his church to the end of the age. Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming, you're showing forth, you're, you're heralding the good news, the Lord's name, His purpose, His work, until He comes. These holy appointments are to be administered only by those who are qualified and called to administer them according to the commission of Christ. And so our Baptist forefathers recognized the Scripture teaches that there are, there are these authoritative under-shepherds that God places over an assembly to lead the congregation in celebrating these biblically and hinder those who should not be celebrating them biblically. Then it moves into the, to its the separate uh, chapter on baptism itself. Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ. To those baptized, it is a sign of their fellowship with Him in His death and resurrection. You see the powerful picture there. When you speak about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and you see someone standing in the waters of, of the baptistry and see them going under as if buried, being raised as if resurrected. And it's always interesting if you notice a man comes in from this side. He turns and walks back. He's made a turn. A woman comes in from this side. She doesn't need to turn uh, for the baptism, but she turns to walk back out. There's powerful pictorial symbols in baptism. It's also a sign of their being grafted into him and of remission of sins. Only those who have biblical confidence that they have been forgiven by God for their sins. And that Jesus Christ has borne the wrath of God for their sins should come into the waters of baptism. And of submitting themselves to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. Another, again, the, the powerful picture. They walk up out of the baptistry. They're going to live that life. Second paragraph, those who personally profess repentance toward God and faith in and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ are the only proper subjects of this ordinance. It's happened to many as I've observed through the years that they, they undertook this as a ritual. It was something that maybe they were encouraged to do, to don't you want to be baptized and that kind of language. And to be dutiful, to be obedient in their minds, they did this. But, they, but when you talk to them about their testimony, they cannot give a story of a saving change. Salvation is a change. It's not a decision. It's a saving change. It's a saving change that is attended by commitments, definite decisions made. I'm going to turn from, from the life I had and walk with Jesus. But it's a change. And so, notice the only proper subjects of this ordinance. That's why there's no way that a case can be made for an infant to be sprinkled and call that what the scripture teaches as baptism. The outward element to be used in this ordinance is water in which the individual is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, the, the triune God, because the triune God is at work in our salvation. The triune God planned salvation in eternity past. He underwent it when he sent Jesus in the fullness of time born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us who are under the curse of the law. He sent the Holy Spirit. The triune God is engaged in saving you and saving me. Immersion, or dipping of the person in water, is necessary for this ordinance to be administered properly. Otherwise, the symbol is lost. I remember reading years ago, a commentator who was of a pedo-baptist persuasion and 
he was exegeting Jesus cry I have a baptism to be baptized with and I'm straightened until it's accomplished and he said oh look at that and I thought how can you how can you teach of, of great unspeakable agony when in your mind and your teaching Jesus is saying I have a sprinkling to be sprinkled in and I'm tightened pressed and you know it loses the power but if Jesus is saying I'm about to face an immersion in suffering that is unspeakable then it takes on its power doesn't it then our confession teaches on the Lord's Supper a little a few more paragraphs than on baptism but again they were taking great constraints to distance themselves from the practice of the Roman Church issuing the wafer in Holy Communion and withholding the cup. And you'll see this in the language here. The Supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by Him the same night He was betrayed. It is to be observed in His churches to the end of the age as a perpetual remembrance and display of the sacrifice of Himself in His death. It is given for the confirmation of the faith of believers in all the benefits of Christ's death, their spiritual nourishment and growth in Him, and their further engagement in and to all the duties they owe to Him. You hear the language here? They've covered it. By the way, when you read your confession, there are scriptural annotations. This is, this is loaded with scripture references that, that today doesn't allow us the time to dig into them. I, I commend you, the reading of this to you. But listen to that. It confirms the faith of believers. They have confessed faith in Christ. The congregation has, has said, we recognize a measure of that, and we welcome you to the waters of baptism. And it, and it really gives a confirmation that I belong to the Lord. I belong to His family. It shows the benefits that accrue to believers of Christ's death. It's spiritually nourishing. While there is no saving power in the Lord's Supper or in, in baptism, it's a sanctifying experience to the extent that someone obeys Jesus Christ when he says to his disciples go into all the world and baptize disciples and we submit to that you're obeying Christ and in obeying Christ there's always sanctifying benefit when you come to the Lord's table you take the elements when he says by command do this and you obey that command has a sanctifying impact on you. It's spiritually nourishing. Obedience to Christ always helps you grow in Christ. And it also reminds us of all the things we owe to Him. The supper is to be a bond and pledge of their communion with Christ and each other. That's why, that's why one of the terms used for it is Holy Communion. Communion. Union together with. In this ordinance, Christ is not offered up to His Father, listen to this, nor is any real sacrifice made at all for remission of sin of the living or the dead. They're, they're going directly against the teaching of the Mass. If you've ever been to a Roman Catholic Mass, I've told you this before, there's a certain point in it when bells ring, when the bells ring, then there's supposed to be a mystical transformation where the wafer becomes the actual corporal body of Christ. Where the through the vine becomes the actual blood of Christ. He said, this, this, this is not that. It's not, don't confuse it. It is only a memorial of the one offering Christ made of himself on the cross once for all. It is also a spiritual offering of the highest possible praise to God for that sacrifice. Thus, the Roman Catholic sacrifice of the Mass, as they call it, is utterly detestable and detracts from Christ's own sacrifice which is the only propitiation for all the sins of the elect. In a day and time, I know this, I could be reading this to someone who's offended by that. But you know something, folks, there's a time, there comes a time in life when you draw a cow and you draw a horse and you say, this horse is not this cow and this cow is not this horse. There is a difference. This Rodney King theology mentality says, can't we all just get along? We can get along at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, trusting only in Him as our once for all sacrifice for sins. And so our, our uh, forefathers, Baptist forefathers, were very specific here. They go on, in this ordinance, the Lord Jesus has appointed His ministers to pray and to bless 
the elements of bread and wine, and in this way, to set them apart from a common to holy use. You can go buy a box of these little unleavened wafers at, uh, at Lifeway, Christian bookstore down in Tulsa. You can make them a snack. And I think they have crunchy, they have soft. But that's not the same as what we did here. You can grab grape juice and drink it to your heart's content. But it's not the same as what we did here. They're to take and break the bread, take the cup, and give both to the communicants while also participating themselves. In this celebration in our context, nobody is above anybody else. We're all honoring the one head over the church, Jesus Christ. Denying the cup to the people, worshiping the elements. Remember I told you the story of Martin Luther when uh, as an Augustinian monk he performed his first mass. He took the cup, held it up. He'd been taught that this would magically, mystically turn into the blood of Christ and he began to, he began to shake and it spilled out of the cup. His father was there. His father was mortified that his son had, had so uh, desecrated the cup. Lifting it up, carrying it around for adoration, reserving them uh, for some pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of this ordinance and to the institution of Christ. The outward elements in this ordinance, properly set apart for the use ordained by Christ, have such a relationship to Christ crucified that they are sometimes called, truly though figuratively, by the names of the things they represent, that is, the body and blood of Christ. However, in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine as they were before. The doctrine commonly called, again going after the Roman Catholic era, transubstantiation teaches that the substance of bread and wine is changed into the substance of Christ's body and blood by the consecration of a priest or some other way. This doctrine is hostile not only to Scripture, but also to common sense and reason. It destroys the nature of the ordinance and has been and is the cause of many kinds of superstitious, superstitions and gross idolatries. Then he moves on to speak about the worthiness of the person participating. Worthy recipients who outwardly partake of the visible elements in this ordinance also by faith inwardly receive and feed on Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death. See the difference there? It's a spiritual, sanctifying nourishment. They do so really and truly, yet not physically and bodily, but spiritually. The body and blood of Christ are not present bodily or physically in the ordinance, but spiritually to the faith of believers, just as the elements themselves are present to their outward senses. You see what's going on here? They've taken great pains to be sure that, that Baptists who would be taught in churches know what this is and what it is not. It's not a cow. It's a horse. All ignorant by the way, ignorant, the word that comes from means not knowing. It's not, we use it in an offensive way, but it really was just someone who didn't, doesn't know. Ignorant and ungodly people are unfit to enjoy communion with Christ and are thus unworthy of the Lord's table. As long as they remain in this condition, they cannot partake of these holy mysteries or be admitted to the Lord's table without committing a great sin against Christ. All those who receive the supper unworthily are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, eating and drinking judgment on themselves because it is a powerful symbol of the body of Christ being broken and blood being shed. We do not treat it lightly. We do not tack it on to the end of a service so we can check a box that says we've done it. We try on a regular, consistent basis to remember, bring all of us centered focus to remember Jesus Christ in, in these visible ways that He has commanded that we remember Him. There was a day 
in this country, when evangelical churches understood that if a church was going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, that their members would move heaven and earth to be there, only being providentially hindered would keep them away. There was a day, and I've read the historical documents, where members who were habitually absent from the Lord's Supper would find themselves under discipline. Some might say, well, that's harsh. I say, that's taking it seriously. That's taking it seriously. There was a day when a member would not have thought to miss a service if someone newly professing faith in Christ was going to be baptized by immersion. Why am I saying that to you? I don't want us to be a congregation where these things are passe. They're not passe in the New Testament. People admitted to the waters of baptism in the New Testament, it cost them their lives. And today, in the United Arab Emirates that Joshua read about, to walk into water deep enough for you to be plunged under that water can cost you your life in the UAE and in many other places around the world. I say, at the beginning of 2018, God's brought us through 2017. He let us live to see the dawn of this. I say, let us recommit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ by recommitting ourselves to His, His visible, tangible demonstrations of what His life, death, burial, and resurrection looks like and what we are committed to as we confess that we have become by grace through faith His followers. What a wonderful way to start the new year. I pray that every one of you will go home. I'd love to think you could get out your confession and read over this yourself and meditate upon it. But think, or I, I pray you would get the confession down and trace the scripture references down that are, that are attached to it. And reflect upon who Jesus Christ is and what He came to do for you. And repurpose to live for Him this year. I know there are those here who are not yet followers of Christ. My prayer for you is that as you've seen people baptized today, that you would be pressed upon by the Lord to ask, why have I not submitted myself to believer's baptism? As you saw the elements pass by you when, when believers took those today in celebrating Jesus Christ, ask yourself, why am I not participating in that? And then come face to face because you have not yet confessed faith in Jesus Christ. You've not yet repented for your sins to God and trusted in Jesus Christ, His perfect life, His death in the place of repenting sinners. His resurrection from the grave, conquering every enemy we have, sin, death, hell, and the grave. You've not yet repented to God and trusted in Christ. And my prayer would be that before 2018 gets underway very far, that you'd come face to face with your need for a Savior and become convinced by the Spirit that He died for you and rose again. And you would confess Him as your Lord and Savior. My prayer always is, as I anticipate this service, Lord, may not another service pass like this, except people come to faith in Christ and get to join us at the table of the family of God. Let's pray.